Good morning, everybody. This is the time where we sit and watch and wait and listen for the clock in the other room to stop chiming 12 o'clock. We let the notifications go out that we're getting ready to go live. Good morning, everybody. This is Damn. the time I come there along, sit, find and the button, watch and wait <laughs> and listen and then hit that button and say, hey, y'all, happy Sunday to you. What's going on? What's shaking? Oh, man, it's been a heck of a week. I'm here to tell you what. Hope everybody is doing well and uh, hope everybody is uh, staying safe, staying hydrated in this heat. Those of us in the northern hemisphere, I know a few of y'all down there are are screaming that uh, it's the dead of winter. What are you talking about heat? And I see somebody new here is uh, the Slash 318 calling for Dr. Disrespect. You know, it's funny. I had never, ever heard of Dr. Disrespect until like, oh, three weeks ago when somebody asked me about my logo. No, I ha I had no idea who Dr. Disrespect was. I've looked him up. He's a gamer. Okay, fine. I'm not a video gamer. I've been using this logo for, oh, five, six, seven years now. And um, that's all I know. So, nope, not Dr. Disrespect. So, sorry. I'm just some dude in a shed with a homemade CNC router. Let me go down the list here and see who's talking with us. Uh, we have Richard Poulin has joined us. Uh, and uh, Ice Cream 62 checking in from Italy watching Dragon 2 re-enter. Cool. Uh, let's see. Mario Medina, how you doing, my friend? And then, and then Steve Nealon from Harneo Media checking in from Mississippi. Hope you're doing well, Steve. Uh, you will find a link in the description of this live stream to a GoFundMe called Makers Helping Makers. That is to benefit Steve at Harneo Media and his wife Pam after Steve's um, heart problems. And uh, just to help them kind of get through life while he is still unable to... Uh, still unable to generate an income he's kind of flat on his back he had some major surgery and we hope all is going well we uh hope you're feeling better anyway steve but uh if you would click that link and go to that gofundme and if you have donated i want to give my personal thank you if you uh haven't I completely and totally understand, but do me a favor. Please go to that GoFundMe and share that GoFundMe onto your social media, if you would, please. I would take that as a personal favor. Steve is uh, a very close, dear friend of mine, and he and his wife are struggling a little bit right now, and they could use everybody's help. So the more folks we can get that GoFundMe in front of, the better off everybody will be. So uh, the link is down in the description of this video, and uh, I thank you for that. Let's see who else we have here. Mr. Ayal Peleg from Israel, Dave Krause, William Stauffer, David Roby. How you doing? Checking in from Florida. Uh, Muhammad Saeed from Pakistan. Wow, truly international audience here. Uh, Kurt Briegel from Wisconsin, Wade Nash from Southern California, Miss Becca Miller checking in from Texas, Kevin Ells down there in South Africa, Steve Thomas, and of course I've already mentioned the Slash 318, David Dietrich also from Michigan checking in, Dennis Mills, Jill Knight also from Texas, Paul Stewart, uh, Jeff Norland, uh, Aaron Hansen, Roger the Tinker, Mr. Charles Lawrence, Michael Johnston from Rainy Scotland. I don't think that it's 
ever not rainy in Scotland, is it? <laughs> I don't know. My wife visited Scotland. As a matter of fact, I got the notification this morning. When she went to Scotland in 2017, it was three years ago today, I took them up and put them on the plane up in Portland. And while she was there, she got herself a T-shirt that has is divided into four panels with sheep on it. And it's broken up into winter, spring, summer, and fall. And in all four of them, the sheep is being rained on. So that kind of established that for me. But, hey, you know, from what I saw, it was gorgeous there. Let's see, Mervyn from Poppy's Woodshed is in the audience today also. Let's see, B. Todd Cox, another Texan. Uh, Dennis Mill, South Carolina. William Starkey. Bill from Ohio, new to CNC. Welcome aboard. Troy F. Owen Jenkins. Jeff from Connecticut there. Woody Wan. And Rob Roy. I've had your drinks. So, welcome aboard, everybody. Thank you for spending part of your Sunday with me. And uh, I'm glad to see everybody here. Let's get the easy question over and done with now uh, from the Slash 318. Do you know how to play an instrument? The only in the only thing I know how to play is the stereo. That is it. I can build a guitar. My grandson is the family guitarist. He's my beta tester, but I don't play worth a ding dong. I used to know a couple of chords, but... I just like the building part of it. So, but I figure, you know, I'm not in any way, shape, manner, or form in the same league as Leo Fender, but he couldn't play guitar either. So I figure if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. <laughs> so this morning, I dropped the video of the project introduction to my new shop shed build, showed you what I'm working with. Um, and what I'm hoping to build up to. It's, um, like I said in the video, a 8 foot wide, 12 foot deep, overblown shipping container that is literally falling apart. I keep nailing stuff together to keep it standing just long enough for me to get a new one built. And uh, then it's going to be demolished. And I'm going to take great pleasure in doing that demolition, believe me. So um, thank everybody for watching that. That video has really taken off. I'm kind of surprised that it's as popular as it is. But uh, we're here to talk about it or anything else. Um, I see Richard has already asking me um, how tall is the workshop going to be inside. You said that your max height is 10 feet. It's probably for the outside. Do I get snow in my state? Um, the finished shed with the ridge vent that I have uh, picked out for it is going to be nine and a half feet tall. I'm figuring on having an eight foot ceiling, but that's okay. I'm a short guy. I'm five foot seven. I don't need a 10 foot ceiling in a shop. I've been working with a uh, seven and a half foot ceiling since we moved in here. So if I have eight feet, that's a little more than I've got now. Uh, as far as snow, we don't get much snow at all. In fact, in it was either 2015 or 2016, we got eight inches of snow overnight and Historically speaking, that was the second heaviest snowfall in 24 hours that this valley has gotten in recorded history. We sit at right around 1,300 feet above sea level, and it's very temperate here. We do get down into the teens and 20s on occasion overnight, but snow is a rare thing. If we get snow at all, it's usually melted and gone within 24 hours but like we didn't get any snow this last winter we got no snow at all we got a trace of snow the year before that it, we just don't get snow very often at all i don't remember the exact slope of the roof 
but I can find that out. And I'll, when I uh, start showing that, the, the actual shit, I'll talk about it then. So, let's see. Uh, Mario Medina asked over in the comment section on the video uh, if I was going to be laying down a vapor barrier. Yes, I will be. That's uh, something that I forgot to even mention with the um, uh, when talking about the gravel pad. There is going to be a road cloth, uh, a woven geotextile fabric laid down inside the frame and stapled to that frame of that perimeter. Then the uh, gravel uh, moved into place and then compacted with a plate compactor. And that's more or less to keep the gravel from settling down and just losing it in the dirt. But it's also a part of a vapor barrier. Now, the entire shed is going to be wrapped with six mil underneath and then normal house wrap around the outside because I do plan on insulating and uh, having heat for the winter and air conditioning for the summer. Um, I don't know if you've noticed in the long run here on my channel, if you go back and look at what I've been doing, the my projects tend to run seasonally. I go outside and I cut projects in the spring and in the autumn. I'm not out there cutting projects in the dead of winter, and I'm not out there in the summertime. For instance, um, two days ago, the temperature here was 105 Fahrenheit, and that, I want to say, is right at about 41 Celsius. And that's the free air temperature outside. It was about 120 inside the shop, and that's just too hot to work, so forget it. So I don't do any projects during the summertime out there right now. Well, I want to end that. I want to be able to go out there and work whenever I want to. Usually what happens is I set up a canopy out in the driveway and I do most of my work outside. But the CNC, you have to be in there <laughs> to watch it, work with it, and set it up. So, so let's see. Uh, Steve, let's say the um, shop pad is looking good. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm hoping so. I all pay leg says I seem to have very high energy levels. That's all done in the post processing, man. That's all done with editing. I don't know what I ever did to give anybody the idea that I had high energy levels because I just certainly don't have them. So, um, let's see. I all pay leg says... Um, I have a garden shed that is about four by six meters, about 13 by 20, and it's so packed I have to clear it up so I could turn it into a workshop and start my Gatton build. Yeah, I started, as I've said before, um, in the eight by 12, and I have, I have right now currently a six foot by 12 foot shed off to the side of the shop. You probably saw it when I was walking around. And I have a lot of tools in there. My compressor's in there, my drill press, and all of my little portable benchtop tools are in there. And that's what I have to drag out and use in the driveway under a canopy. But um, eventually I would like to add a second shed to use for standard woodworking. But it's going to be a case of um, my benchtop tools will have to stay benchtop tools for now. And uh, the other larger tools are all on wheels, so I can push them up against the wall to get them out of the way and then pull them out to use them. So I have made do with a lot less, believe me. <laughs> so let's see here. Um, let's see. See, I'm trying to... Okay, William Starkey, Bill from Ohio, new to CNC. Find your videos very informative. Thank you very much, Bill. I do appreciate that. Um, I all Peleg said, I wish there was a bot here that would translate all those feet units into meters. Google is your friend, my friend. I know it's a pain to open up a new tab, and but just 
I just type in, uh, like doing that um, translation from uh, 105 degrees Fahrenheit to 41 Celsius. I just type in a Google search, 105 F in centigrade, and it there's a built-in calculator, it told me. So if I say two meters, I can just say two meters in feet, and it'll tell me. So let's see. Kurt Briegel says, I'm upgrading my shop with more power when I purchased the property. There was a 100-amp service in it. Now it's going to be doubled, then add a clean room for painting and staining. Yeah, that's another reason I would like a second shed, because I do want a clean room for painting and staining as well. Um, as it sits right now, I have to cover everything up and just make sure there's no dust. So um, I currently have... Uh, and that's what I'm going through right now with a few electrician friends. I currently have 200 amp service here at the house. And I'm going to be running a 100 amp sub panel back there uh, to the shed. And I figure that's going to be enough. There will be some 220 volt uh, tools back there. And once I have 220 volts, I'm going to upgrade to a water-cooled, or excuse me, an air-cooled spindle. I don't want to mess mess with the uh, water cooling in this climate. Uh, and it's going to be 220 volts, so you can look forward to that. Let's see, uh, Becca Miller, I wish we used metric here so much more accurate. No, it's not. It's the same as the same. I mean, you know. Metric is great until you have to divide by three. Base 12 is always better because it can be divided evenly by more numbers. You know, 10 can only be divided by 2, 5 in itself. 1, 2, 5 in itself. So, well, let's see here. Um, so you're going to run your dust collection on the ceiling. Yes, I am. And the way I'm setting up is there's going to be a small lean-to shed on the back of the shed. And my compressor will be on one side. My dust collector will be on the other side. And I'm, I'm just going to be able to come through the wall, straight through the wall right there, and plumb right overhead. The CNC will be right there back in the, back in the uh, corner with a little bit more room around it than I have now. Well, who am I kidding? A lot more room around it than I have now. So, yes, I will be able to run dust collection that way and then also have my compressor hardwired outside so that I don't have to keep running back and forth with extension cords and stuff like that, like I'm doing now. So, let's see... Uh, going down here. Uh, William Starkey, have you ever thought of using recycled crushed concrete instead of gravel? I found it compacts better. Uh, we do use that around here for some things, but the reason I'm going for the, gosh, I'm trying to think of the name of it now. Anyway, it's three quarter inch crushed rock washed. And the reason I'm getting the washed is because you don't want the fines and the dust in there with it. You want water to be able to drain through and run off. So the there's going to be six inches, on average about six inches of gravel there. I want the water to go through that gravel and out to get it away. So nothing is sitting in uh, standing water. So, uh, we do use crushed concrete for some things. For instance, the sand that our swimming pool is sitting on, uh, that's recycled crushed concrete. But for this, I do need to allow water to drain through. Let's see. Um, Paul Stewart wants to know, how long do you expect this shed project to take? Depends on how long my back holds out. Um, I'm working through some of the details on the electrical install right now. I am scheduled to go pick up the trencher uh, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock and hopefully have all that trench run. And then from there, I should be able to order. I, 
I believe in completing stages before I move on to the next stage. So when I get that trench dug, then I could order the gravel and arrange delivery. So I might have gravel delivered by next weekend. And then bringing it out there, wheelbarrow, one wheelbarrow at a time, and then um, go down and rent the uh, plate compactor and compact it. So it's... I'm looking at possibly being ready to get down and talk to the shed guy and get it ordered. Possibly not this, not tomorrow, Monday, but the Monday after. We'll just see what, what happens. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, let's see. IL says, yes, he uses Google for the unit conversions all the time, but there are some cases where the units are arriving so fast. I wish I had a babble fish in my ear. You and me both, but at least it appears we both know where our towels are. Um, Aaron Hansen, not to get too personal, but when done, can you give us your cost of this project? Yeah, I have no problem with that, and I can let you know as soon as I know. Now, what I have done is... Um, I have I, I budgeted a thousand dollars for site prep and getting the pad created and so far I'm I'm right on line um, with that it, the gravel okay one of the reasons this is taking so long is because I've got about four different projects going at the same time I'm landscaping uh, the yard for my wife. Uh, building big flower beds, raised bed boxes, and part of this is going to include a about 200 foot long French drain. And that French drain, I'm going to be trenching for that as well. So I have to order gravel for that and a gravel path around her flower beds and the gravel pad for the shed. So I've got 10 yards of gravel that I'm going to be getting and that's going to put me right at that upper limit of a thousand dollars for my site prep but uh, and after that it's just going to depend on um, what the final cost of the shed's going to be and um, I still haven't taken into account the electrical and all that other good stuff so Okay, I hope I don't butcher this name. Um, I don't know if it's Fasu or Faku Piri. Uh, hey, Mark, I'm new on this, and I was seeing CNC for home working. Uh, but usually the height of the workspace is less than five centimeters. I like to do figures like Buddhas with a four, fourth axis. But that limits a lot. Yeah, it does. Um, let's see. Here's a good example. 5 cm in inches is... Well, 5 centimeters is not quite 2 inches. That's well within the realm of possibility for a rotary axis um, are you having problems finding um, a rotary that would uh, that is uh, that would cut that size because mine does mine I set mine up to um, I set mine up to where I could turn a six inch so let's see six inch would be how many cm's uh, 15 centimeters so it's it's very much within the realm of possibility. So, you know, um, it, you might just want to look at how you um, mount it. Uh, that was the main thing with me. If I had to do it all over again, I would not have made that cutout in the front of my machine because I limited the length of uh, 
that I can chuck between centers on the rotary. I would have tried to turn it around to run with my Y to get a little bit more capacity. But um, that's, you know, going to be um, something that may, may happen down the road. But uh, five centimeters should be well within, you know, unless you're doing something that's extremely heavy or extremely long. But I still don't see a problem with five centimeters. You should be able to uh, put something five centimeters, uh, chuck that in the rotary axis very easily. So let's see. Kurt Briegel wants to know for your dust collection, are you going to use PVC or HVAC metal pipe? Um, you know, I, I haven't gotten that far yet. I really don't know. Um, I know some people get all weirded out when you start talking about grounding your dust collection. I do ground my dust collection pipe, but for no other reason than to cut down on static because it's been my experience. Dust collectors create static electricity and static electricity is the enemy of a CNC's electronics. Um, I will look for it. I don't remember who it was. Oh, yes, I do remember who it was. I'll have to look for the video. And I don't want to mention the name now because I'll probably get it wrong. But he posted a video on the static buildup, the static electricity that builds up on his drum sander and then arcs over out of the drum sander onto something else that was sitting nearby it. And I mean, it was a constant zap, zap, zap. So I ground my dust collection to avoid a buildup of static to the point to where it wants to arc over onto something. That, uh, and knowing my luck, it would arc over onto something that I can't replace, that I would have to, or that I can't fix and I would have to replace. So... Um, I do ground my dust collection, not because I'm worried about a dust explosion. That's a whole nother controversy I don't want to get into, but just simply to cut down on static electricity. If it's grounded, that static doesn't build up. It dissipates as it's created. And um, I've grounded every dust collector I've ever put in, and it works for me. So... So let's see, uh, rent the machine you leveled the ground with to haul your rock or they have power wheelbarrows. Yes, I could go down and rent that. That was called a dingo. Now, to avoid confusion, if we have anybody in Australia watching, there is a machine down there called a dingo. This is made by a company called Toro and the model is dingo. And you have your choice of, it, it's a little uh, subcompact um, earth mover. I mean, it, it, skid steer. It, and they have all kinds of attachments on it. You can get trenchers, you can get buckets, you can get forks, you can get augers. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Um, so I could rent that, but that's another $150 a day. I'll see if it's in the budget. If it is in the budget, I'm with you, Aaron, because that thing moved a wheelbarrow full of material at a time. And that first um, time lapse that was up there with me running that dingo in the backyard, that ran until the uh, battery in my camera died. And that was about six hours. I had to teach myself how to use the thing because I'd only seen videos of it. I'd never used one, but it's a fun little tool. It's a great tool. And like I say, I was moving a wheelbarrow full of material at a time and it really came in handy. So I may, if that's in the budget, if not, I'm just going to have to shovel and wheelbarrow it back there. But then again, I'm looking at close to five yards of gravel that I'm going to have to put back there. So I I may be doing the uh, I may be doing the dingo thing again. <laughs> e cabinet tips and tricks. Welcome aboard. Let's see, uh, Michael Johnston. When you complete your workshop, will you be considering a larger CNC bed? 
or are you happy with what you have now? You know, I really don't know at this point. Um, part of me is saying to go with something a little bit deeper and why, but the other part of me is saying you've not used the capacity of your machine now. So, you know, I know a lot of us like to think that the bigger the CNC, the better, but the overwhelming majority of the projects I have ever cut on my CNC have been somewhere about 24 inches or smaller in width and about 12 to 13 inches deep in Y. I very rarely cut anything that's big. I built the wider CNC so because I was going to start. I wanted to uh, model and cut uh, two bass guitar necks, and so I needed some width there. But uh, that project kind of fell through. The person no longer wants it, so now I have this big CNC, and I've just never used it. So I don't know. Part of me says yes, go a little bit deeper, and why? But another part of me says why bother? Just you know, make an outfeed table and tile my tool paths. So we'll see. Um, let's see. Carl Gierke says, is your shop stick built on site or factory built and delivered? Uh, yes to both. It is, it's built and assembled at the factory, then blown apart into the major components, except for like the roof shingles and what have you. But they bring in the, uh, it's a galvanized steel frame that actually sits on the ground. And then they lay the, they assemble that uh, floor joist 16 inches on center. And then they sheathe it with the floor material. They bring the walls in, set them up, attach the walls, then the roof trusses, then uh, sheathe the roof and shingles, and then the uh, ridge cap the, uh, excuse me, ridge vent. So it will be assembled here. And that's another reason why I'm buying the shed. And that is simply because there is no other way I would have a 12 by 16 shed in one day. Doing it by myself, there's no way. And it is myself. I mean, my wife is here to help me, but she had knee replacement done in November and I'm just not asking her to do anything strenuous. So it's just me by myself and just getting up on the roof to build a roof. Yeah, I'm tired of it. Let the professionals do it. Traditionally with me, the hardest part of doing it myself has always been knowing when not to. But the older I get, the easier it is to make that decision. So now I don't want to tinker with it. I don't want to work on it. I don't want to build it. I want to use it. So I'll pay the people who get paid to build it and um, go with it from there. So believe me, there will be a plenty of work because I mean, just running the electrical is going to be a, an adventure. And then I get to insulate it and then do the inside walls. I'm thinking of using oriented strand board OSB on the inside walls, or I might just use uh, half inch plywood. I haven't decided yet. So you can leave your opinion down in the description <laughs> of this. And, uh, well, you know, I'll check it out and see what all y'all thinks. Uh, I saw Mervin in there talking about from Poppy's tool shed saying to make my wife uh, a she shed out of the old one. Oh, no. Oh, no. That puppy is going to get demolished. The slab is going to get broken up and hauled away, and I'm going to take great delight in every single swing of the hammer. I may go out and buy an old beater pickup to drive through it. I haven't decided yet. Film at 11. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Todd H. C. C. I ground mine just to keep from getting shocked. I'm with you. I had that problem too. That was when I started looking into grounding a dust collector. And that was back before I ever had a CNC. And that was just the constant air movement through that PVC pipe that it was plumbed through, or even just the vacuum hose. It was just nothing but uh, 
static electricity and you reach out to do something and that thing will arc out that far and zap you? Heck no. So let's see. Um, Roger the Tinker, are you using a cyclone collector or a two-stage dust collector? I haven't decided yet, but they will probably be a cyclone. I haven't decided that yet. Um, let's see. Jim Pell joining us late. Well, I hope you brought a note. Um, <laughs> yeah, I see my wife, Linda, has uh, joined the fray. Welcome aboard, darling. And yes, she does want that thing gone. In fact, uh, when we do demolish it, I'm going to be putting cross fencing there. That privacy fence, I ran it down to even with the front end of the shed. And then I'm going to put a 10-foot uh, drive gate and then a 40-inch wide man gate in there so that we can close that. Uh, David Roby, can you uh, put a link to the shed company? If not, that's fine. Not yet. We're still hammering out some details. And I want to make sure I'm going to go with this company before I announce that I'm going with this company. So believe me, you will know who I'm going with uh, the minute that is finalized and we're done. So <laughs> let's see. Uh, Benjamin. Okay, I'm going to try not to butcher your name. Would that be Shower or Shoyer? Hi, Mark. I make pens. Do you have any videos on this? Uh, he has a uh, Shark SD100 with a Mini 4th Axis. I have VCarve Pro in the program. There are Spindle Profile. How do I get it to work? Thank you. I, I'm going to get into more rotary axis videos as soon as it cools down enough for me to be inside um, and work. But right now, I don't. Um, as far as making pens on the rotary axis, I thought about it, but it would seem to me that unless you're really doing something wild with the profile, it would be faster to use a lathe. Um, I can, I, I can understand maybe wanting to rough, rough in the, um, the shape maybe if you're. I don't know, using a hunk of firewood or something, and you want to turn. Even then, I think it would be quicker to do on a lathe. But um, that's just me. I don't know. Uh, I have not done anything on the rotary in a long time. I do need to get back to work with it, though. Um, so one answer is no. The next answer, come back soon. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I.L. Peleg asked me a question earlier that I missed. Um, can you explain why you prefer air-cooled spindle? Why is this related to 220 versus 110? We have 220 here, but I was under the impression that water cooling is better. Is it not? It is one and a half. It, it, it's six of one and half a dozen of the other. The reason I'm waiting for 220 volt is because I would rather have the 220 volt spindle than the 110. I can get a larger spindle. I can get a 2.2 kW spindle running 220 volt. And I think the most I can get is a 1.5 kW spindle on 110 volt. And I would just soon have that extra torque from a 220 volt system. Um, as far as air cooled versus water cooled, water cooled is fabulous. And you don't have that wind from trying to cool running through the spindle. But you do have the problem with water and antifreeze during the winter and coolant during the summer. I just don't want that hassle. So... Air-cooled would be a better bet for me. It just eliminates one other potential problem, running coolant lines and antifreeze and draining and changing out the uh, coolant in the system and it getting plugged up because of hard water and this, that. I'll just go with an air-cooled system, a 220-volt air-cooled spindle, and eliminate that as a factor, just not have that maintenance. So... Uh, let's see. 
Steve Late says, I used the OSB on the inside of my shed. It's half the price of plywood here. It is here too. I'm just not much of a fan of the look. It just depends on what I do. Now, I'm a weird case in that, and this is going to sound egotistical and I don't mean it this way. A lot of this stuff is going to be done. Um, for instance, when I get it finished, I'm also running uh, uh, Cat 6 cable out there so I can do this from out there. I'll be doing my uh, live Q&As from the shop so that I can answer machine questions right there. Um, and so it needs to look good. And that's just the fact. It, it just needs to look good. And I've never really cared much for OSB. Uh, I know I could paint it, but um, it. I just prefer if I'm going to be hanging stuff on the walls, especially tools and what have you, um, I would just soon it be on something smooth and at least decent looking. So I don't know yet. Let's see. Um, Owen Jenkins, is tiling done with dowels in the spoil board? I will put a link to Peter Pasuelo's video on, um, on tiling down in the description. Let's see. Tiling. Just wrote myself a, a uh, note to put a link to his video down in the description of this video. I have not tiled two toolpaths on my CNC. I haven't needed to. But Peter has, and he did an excellent video on how to do it. I'll link it in the description um, to his video over on his channel, CNC Nuts. It is an excellent channel. If you're not a subscriber to Peter Pasuelo over on his channel, CNC Nuts, uh, click the link to the video that I'll put in the description of this video and subscribe. Peter was the first CNC guy I subscribed to, and oh man, he I, I have learned so much from that guy. It's not even it's not even funny. He's really really excellent. So let's see. Um, uh, Kurt Briegel says you mentioned having your air compressor and dust collection system in a separate area. Do you have plans for sound deaden deadening? And if enclosed, how do you plan on airflow? One step at a time. I'm not there yet. Yes, I will have to sound deaden, but I will also, uh, I will put vents for flow through ventilation in there. But um, where we live, we're in a residential area, but that back corner where I'm at is pretty far away from just about every home. And if I can remember to shut off the compressor breaker when I leave the shed, it won't be sitting there running when nobody's working it. Um, and, of course, the uh, dust collector won't be coming on until I start needing it. But um, it, 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 there's, there are some compromises with doing this in a residential area. Uh, you know, I can't go out at 530 in the morning and fire up the table saw. I got you know, neighbors I have to concern myself with, but that's fine. After about eight 30, everybody's gone. And if I'm honest, that's about the time I want to get up and go to work. So <laughs> I'm retired. I do this as a hobby. So, um, I will get further into that, um, the sound deadening and ventilation for that after I get it built, uh, or while I'm building it. So let's see. Uh, Steve Thomas wants to know the best place to buy CNC bits, wherever you get them. Um, it's I've ordered them off of Amazon. I've ordered them off of eBay. I've gone down to my local Lowe's and Home Depot and bought them there. It just depends on what you're after. If you're looking for just standard end mills, um, I don't think think I'm not a person that has a lot of brand loyalty. I think if it works for you, it works for you. Uh, for my upcut and downcut spiral end mills, I've been using Bosch uh, upcut and downcut uh, mortising bits and they work like a champ. And I can run down to Lowe's and grab one right now if I need it. 
but they're a little bit more expensive that way, but I don't have to wait on it. If I need it now, I need it now and I got to go get it. Now, if it's something like uh, previews of coming attractions, if it's something like this thread milling bit, I ordered this off of Magnate's website, and I'll put a link to them in the description. I'll put a link to this bit sold by Magnate on eBay in the description. So um, I, I, I'm not one of those people who's going to tell you to buy a mana or Whiteside or Onsrud or anything like that. I think they all have their good and bad. Uh, it's more important that you get the right bit than anything else. So if you're looking for an upcut spiral, I think so long as you get uh, solid carbide, they're all pretty much the same. Um, now, having said that, the Amana Spectra coated uh, downcut and upcut bits are very nice, but they're also very pricey. So it's a trade off. And when you're just starting out and learning the capabilities of your machine, sometimes cheaper is better. Uh, I know a lot of people buy Yonico bits off of Amazon, and I've never heard a bad thing about them. And they're not super expensive. So, okay, let's see. I'm trying to get caught up here. And holy cow, I've already been on for 45 minutes. Um, uh, Mark, thanks for your videos. This is Joshua Shavers, excuse me. Any tips on V-car inlays with a 15-degree bit? Uh, no, I have no tips at all for inlays. I have yet to do my first inlay. I will be getting into that before the end of the year. And, um, you know, it, it, right now I really don't have anything to add to that, uh, conversation because I've not done one and I have a deep philosophical problem with anybody with, with presuming to try to teach somebody something that I've never done myself. So no short answer is I don't have any tips for you on V carb inlays other than try it and, and practice in, uh, in scrap. That's all. So, uh, let's see. Jim Pell, is there a gassing off problem with OSB in a closed area? Only the day after Taco Tuesday. Um, Todd H C and C. I like plywood over OSB for a painted wall in a shop. I'm with you. I'm with you there. Um, Jim, I didn't mean to be so flip with that. Um, there's going to be gassing off of any engineered wood, be it plywood or be it uh, OSB. Um, you know, if I run with uh, something like a CDX plywood, uh, the fact that it's an exterior grade probably means there's a little bit of formaldehyde in the glue. So, you know, uh, it's just going to be a matter of get it up on the wall let it sit for a few days, prime it and paint it. There's going to be some gassing off of just about anything that you put up there unless you go shiplap. But um, I'm not uh, I'm not wedded to one or the other. I just kind of see it as, you know, swings and rounds about roundabouts. It's going to be about the same. So OSB or plywood, there's going to be some off gassing. Not to mention, you know, I don't know if I'm going to go with a spray foam or if I'm going to do the uh, 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 insulated bat or uh, solid rigid foam. I don't know what kind of insulation I'm going to go yet. It's just going to depend. So if you're an insulation contractor that services Southern Oregon, call me. Let's see. Um, Richard says, if you paint it, you will have better light reflection. But don't forget, we're getting old and all right. Yes, I know. You're... Yes, I know. My eyes are getting older. And I do plan on painting it. I'm going to go with LED lighting, the four video that'll give me a good color temperature. So, um, four video. Let's see. Cliff DeWitt for simple bits. Rockler has a lifetime warranty on their bits. Not top of the line, but good for simple carbon bits. Um, yeah, I mean, you can get warranties all over the place, but 99 times out of 100, if you wear them out, 
you just wear them out and move on to the next one. I mean, bits are expendable items to me. Bits are like masking tape or wood glue because you're, depending upon what you cut, you're only going to get so much service life out of a bit. And while, yes, you can send them out and get them resharpened, you only have to resharpen a bit once or twice before you get into diminishing gains. And it's cheaper just to replace it. So, you know, I've got some older bits out there that I don't use anymore. I need to just throw them away. I'm just too Scottish to do that. So, you know. Uh, let's see. We need to start redlining this because I need to close her up. Todd H. C. and C. Mineral wool for insulation. Yeah, I'm looking at rock wool. Um, I hate working with fiberglass with a passion. Uh, let's see. Owen Jenkins. Why down cut? Does that drive shavings into the cutter? No. If anything, it'll put the shavings behind the cutter. Uh, down cut bits are used when the top surface is the important part. The It is spiraled in such a way that as the bit spins, it slices the wood fibers in a downward direction so you don't get chip out up on the surface. The side, the side effect of that is it does push the, the chips down, but with that spiraling also means they tend to get packed in the path they just cut behind the bit. So um, they both have a time and a place, an up cut and a down cut. I tend to use down cut more often than I use up cuts. Um, a down cut bit I use when the edge, the top edge is the important part that I need to make nice and pretty. I'll use an up cut when the bottom surface is the face that needs to be nice and pretty. And I'll even use both if I need both faces to be nice and pretty. I don't have any compression bits yet. Um, I need to go ahead and just order some. But uh, I will say an upcut will give you a better pocket finish. The bottom of the pocket, an upcut does much better because it evacuates those chips. Where a downcut tends to kind of leave more machining marks, more tooling marks. So what I've been known to do is uh, do the profile of a pocket with a down cut, but clear out the inside of the pocket with an up cut. It works for me. So, okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and land the plane here. Good grief, 52 minutes. Nobody's going to want to watch this after the fact. But then again, maybe they will. Who knows? Um, again, I don't know that. This is not going to be a weekly series or a monthly series. This is going to be one of those as I make progress series, you know. Um, next will be getting the trench cut and the electrical cable roughed out there. Then bury that and bring in the gravel and compact it. And... From there, who knows? So I have no clue what next week's video is going to be. Um, I've just given a little primer. Maybe it'll be on up cut bit versus straight bit versus down cut versus compression. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But I want to say thank you to everybody for spending part of your Sunday with me. Thank you very much again if you have contributed to the GoFundMe to help Steve and Pam out. Thank you from me personally. Uh, link to that GoFundMe is in the description of this video. If you've got a few dollars, pounds, rand, baubles, whatever your denomination is, uh, I would appreciate uh, if you'd give Steve a little love. If you can't, uh, at least please share that GoFundMe so we can get it in front of more eyeballs. I really would appreciate that. Thank you very much for hanging with me. Thanks for spending part of your Sunday with me. I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye now. Get out and make some chips. Get out and do something cool. Give me about five minutes and I'll have those links put in the description. Y'all take care.